Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 30th May 2019. The list of articles chosen for today's analysis along with the page numbers of Chennai, Bengaluru, Delhi and Thiruvannathapuram editions are provided here. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping for the displayed articles is given in the description box below. And the timestamping for the displayed articles is also provided in the comment section for the benefit of smartphone users. Let's move on to our first article discussion. This article discusses about the economic condition of India. The discussion based on this article will be relevant in mains preparation under GS paper 3 in the area Indian economy and issues relating to planning, mobilization of resources, growth, development and employment. In this editorial, the author discusses about the challenging economic agenda that waits for the new finance minister of India. Because some important economic indicators are indicating a slowdown in the Indian economy. First, the author talks about the financial sector. The financial sector is currently facing a liquidity crunch. Always remember that in economics, the word crunch indicates a severe shortage of money or credit. This is mainly happening in the non-banking financial companies, that is the NBFCs. The author worries that the crisis in NBFC could affect the entire financial sector and if it gets more worse, it can even affect the economy itself. In addition to this, banks are also still trying to get back to the original position after the loan defaulting and non-performing assets problem. And one more important thing that is making these problems worse is the policy making which has been at a standstill for more than two months. This is because of the announcement of election schedule. Then the author adds that on May 31, it is likely that fourth quarter GDP growth will be announced by the Central Statistics Office. Based on the high frequency data on the economy, it is likely that GDP growth in the fourth quarter of 2018 to 19, which ended in March, will be below 6.5. Note that the GDP growth was 6.6% in uh, third quarter that ended in December. So the author points out that at this rate, it is difficult to touch the 7% GDP growth for the fiscal year 2018 to 19. Then the author talks about the demand slowdown in the economy. Demand slowdown means there is a gradual reduction in the demand by the consumer. Indian economy is excessively dependent on domestic consumption and a fall in consumer spending means fall in domestic consumption, which is an actual trouble to the economy. Now, this demand slowdown is visible through many factors like uh, commercial vehicle purchasing has been declining for the last few months. Then passenger car sales also fell by 17% in April. Here note that passenger car sales were weak throughout 2018-19 to with growth of just 2.7%. The author notes that the 17% fall is the sharpest drop in 8 years in the passenger car sales. Additionally, two-wheeler sales also fell by 17% in 2018 to 19. Then consumer durable and fast moving consumer goods sales also remain indifferent, meaning there is no growth. This means the demand has not increased. Here note that durables or durable goods is a category of consumer goods that do not have to be purchased frequently. They tend to last for at least three years. Some examples of durables are uh, appliances like television, refrigerator, etc. Then home and office furnishings, jewelry, motor vehicles, etc. Then the fast moving consumer goods or FMCG are products that sell quickly at relatively low cost. They are also called as uh, consumer packaged goods. These goods are purchased frequently and are consumed rapidly, uh, are low priced and are uh, sold in large quantities. FMCGs have a short shelf life because of high consumer demand or because they are perishable uh, like meat, dairy products and baked goods. Also know that fast moving consumer goods sector is the fourth largest sector in the Indian economy. The next factor showing demand slowdown is the fall in domestic air traffic. This fall in growth which happened in April is the first time in six years. Next, the author discusses about the rescuing of uh, non-banking financial companies. The author states that this 
task could be the first priority for the new finance minister. The NBFC crisis started with the IL and FS collapse. Then after that, the NBFC space has been hit by one more pro one problem after another, which led to the drying up of liquidity. That is the decrease in cash flow. Even well-known NBFCs and housing finance companies have been affected by asset liability mismatch. The asset liability mismatch can be explained using the example of NBFCs itself. The NBFCs have borrowed short-term funds from lenders such as banks and then the NBFCs have uh, lent them to long-term projects. This led to cash flow problems because the money lent by NBFC to long-term projects will be returned after the finishing of that long-term and as a result they cannot repay to the banks which gave money to the NBFC. In other words, they have been unable to meet commitments to their own lenders. Also, the NBFCs have been asking for liquidity support from the Reserve Bank of India. But the RBI has been reluctant to do the one thing that will help the NBFCs most. That is opening an exclusive funding window only for NBFCs. The author worries that this crisis would spread to other sectors also. Usually, the real sector's problems spreads to the financial sector. But in this case, there is a real possibility that the vice versa may happen. That is, the financial sector will affect the real sector. Here, note that the real sector at one level, it is about a level of production in the economy. This means uh, it is also about employment, investment, income and consumption. At another level, it is about prices such as consumer prices, input prices, wages, etc. Next, the author lists some solutions for the new government to tackle the mentioned problems of the economy. Firstly, the new finance minister will have to work with the RBI and banks to resolve the NBFC crisis as early as possible. Then the author states that lower tax rates not only boosts revenues but also spur or uh, stimulate economic growth. For this, the new government should push or increase consumption spending. Consumption in economics means the use of goods and services by households. The consumption spending can be increased by putting more money in the hands of the people. This can be done by cutting or lowering income tax rates. The author mentions this as the best way because it is the middle class which will go out and spend the extra money in its hands. And then the author suggests cutting or reducing the corporate taxes as well. For this solution, the author points out to the uh, then finance minister's dream budget of 1997. In this 1997 budget, the then finance minister cut the personal and corporate tax rates sharply and it resulted in growth of the economy. Then another example the author gives is the cutting in corporate taxes in the 2018-19 budget. The finance minister cut corporate tax to 25% for companies with a turnover less than rupees 250 crore. This reduction in tax resulted in 99% of companies filing income tax returns. Next, the author asks the new government to give a push to private investment. This is because as businesses have money to invest more, they tend to expand their capacity and this expansion will lead to creation of more jobs. Then finally, the author wants the new government to focus on the crisis in agriculture and as the solving of agricultural crisis will determine the health of the rural economy because the rural economy is mostly based on the agricultural sector. The author concludes that the re-elected Prime Minister should bring in important reforms that will help the economy to come out of these problems and push the economy further into the high growth sphere. With this, we have come to the end of this analysis. The displayed mains question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next article, which is about the invitation to the Indian Prime Minister to visit Maldives. This article discussion will be relevant in prelim syllabus under the area current events of national importance and, and also under Indian and world physical geography. The discussion will, be, will also be relevant in main syllabus in general studies paper 2 under the area India and its neighborhood relations and also under bilateral agreements involving India and affecting India's interest. The news is that 
the government of the Maldives has invited Prime Minister of India to visit their country in the month of June this year. If that happens, then it will be the first visit of the Indian Prime Minister to a foreign country after the re-election. It is stated that the Indian Prime Minister will address the Parliament of the Maldives government. The Maldivian Parliament is also called as the People's Majlis. It is the Maldives Parliament that has voted to invite the Prime Minister of India. One should note that visiting of leaders, particularly the head of government and head, head of states between countries constitute the political relations between two countries. Also, the close cooperation between India and the Maldives will benefit both the countries and is also important for bringing stability to the Indian Ocean region. The Prime Minister's visit will be a reaffirmation to the neighbourhood first foreign policy of the Indian government. The main highlights or the main negotiations during the visit which is scheduled tentatively on June 7th and 8th are with respect to the collaborations between the two countries in the health sector and also about the mutual legal assistance treaty. Note that more than 20% of teachers and doctors in Maldives are Indians. The mutual legal assistance treaty is about the assistance rendered by the two countries in law related aspects in criminal matters that is relating to arrests, summons etc. In India, Ministry of Home Affairs is the nodal ministry and the central authority for seeking and providing mutual legal assistance in criminal law matters. Now let us see few important information with respect to Maldives. Maldives is a group of islands in the Indian Ocean. The Maldives consist of atolls, coral reefs and low lying coral islands. Atolls are almost circular group of coral islets. Atoll is also called as an island formed by a ring shaped coral reef that encircles a lagoon. One shall note that the word atoll is borrowed by the geographers from the Maldivian term atollu. There are 22 geographical atolls in Maldives. They consist of about 1200 islands to be accurate 1190. But only 200 islands are inhabited by people. The rest of the islands are used mainly for tourism. Note that fishing and tourism are the main industries of the Maldives. The Maldives is situated at around 480 km southwest of Cape Comorin. Cape Comorin is in the southernmost district of Indian mainland that is Kanyakumari. Then an 8 degree channel separates the Lakshadweep and the Maldives. Here the Lakshadweep islands are in the north and the Maldives is in the south of Lakshadweep islands. If you observe, equator passes through the territory in control of Maldives. I am saying territory here because it is found that the equator does not pass through the land part of Maldives. Maldives suffers from global warming and the associated sea water level increase. As it is said that many islands in Maldives are not more than 2 meters height with respect to sea level. Therefore, sea water level increase will be a major threat to the nation. Note that Maldives is a member of Sark nations, but it is not a member of Bimstick member countries as it is not a littoral country of Bay of Bengal. With this, we have come to the end of this article discussion. The display practice plans question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next article which talks about the compensation received by the farmers for the defective seeds. This new article will be relevant in your prelims preparation under current events of national importance, next under Indian polity and governance and also in general science. The article states that after a 7 year fight, two Haryana farmers have been granted compensation of almost rupees 5 lakh. If you see, these farmers have received the compensation after they have won a case at the National Consumer Disputes Redressal Commission or in short NCDRC. As per this case, Indian Farmers Fertilizers Cooperative Limited that is IFCO has to pay the compensation of 5 lakh to these farmers for giving defective seeds for farming. The background story is, two farmers from Hisar district of Haryana had purchased 180 kilogram of gore seeds manufactured by IFCO subsidiary in 2012. That IFCO subsidiary is Indian Farm Forestry Development Cooperative. 
in short IFFDC. According to the farmers, IFFDC assured them that the guar seeds would give proper yield of 8 to 10 quintals per acre. These farmers have followed proper instructions and procedure. They have also ploughed their fields thrice for better yield. But the crop yield was very less than the promised amount of 8 to 10 quintals per acre. On this basis, the farmers have approached National Consumer Disputes Redressal Commission telling that they have been provided defective seeds by IFFDC. Now, based on this news article, let us know in brief about the National Consumer Disputes Redressal Commission, in short, NCDRC. NCDRC is a quasi-judicial commission in India. It was set up in 1988 under the Consumer Protection of Act of 1986. The commission is headed by a sitting or retired judge of Supreme Court of India. Its head office is in New Delhi. Know that quasi means partly or partially. Quasi judicial bodies means bodies that have the power of a court where they can interpret laws similar to that of a court. This quasi judicial body consists of president and 11 members. NCDRC has three types of jurisdiction. They are original, appellate and revisional. Original jurisdiction means it receives complaints for the first time. Appellate jurisdiction means it can review the appeals over the judgments passed by the state consumer dispute redressal commissions which functions at a state level and also judgments uh, passed by district forums at district level. Next, revisional jurisdiction means revisiting its own judgment or the judgment of the state level consumer uh, dis dispute redressal commissions and passing correct or modified judgments. So, appeal is generally a legal right of an aggrieved party, but revision depends on the discretion of the judicial body, due to which it cannot be claimed as a matter of right by any aggrieved party. As per section 21 of Consumers Protection Act of 1986, the national consumer shall have original jurisdiction for cases valued more than 1 crore. It shall also have appellate and revisional jurisdiction from the orders of state commissions or district fora for the rest of the cases. And as per section 23 of Consumer Protection Act of 1986, any person aggrieved by an order of NCDRC may prefer an appeal against such order to Supreme Court of India within a period of 30 days. Here you need not remember the sections of the Consumer Protection Act, but just remember two things from examination point of view. First, the, uh, the NCDRC has original appellate and revisional jurisdiction and secondly, NCDRC judgments can be appealed in Supreme Court. Now, uh, next the uh, news article speaks about the Guar crop. Let us see about Guar in brief now. Guar in English it is called as cluster beans and in Hindi it is called as Guar only and in Tamil it is called as Kuttu Avare. I know that Guar is basically a vegetable. In recent years, it is also grown for its gum. The guar seeds are dehusked, milled and screened to obtain the guar gum. The consumption pattern of guar seeds is, is largely influenced by the demands from the petroleum industry. The demand for gum is due to the expansion of the shale gas or oil industries in countries such as USA, China, Norway, Russia, etc. Guar gum is used in the hydraulic fracturing process so that the shale gas or hydrocarbons can be extracted. As you can see in the picture, shale gas is a natural gas that is trapped in shale formations. Huge amounts of water is mixed with sand and certain chemicals. One of the material used here is guar gum. If you see, Haryana is the second largest producer of guar gum in India after Rajasthan. India accounts for 90% of the world's guar produce of which 72% comes from Rajasthan. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. The display prelims question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next article, which is an editorial about the integrity of data collected by the National Sample Survey Organization. This article discussion will be relevant in prelims syllabus under the area current events of national importance and under Indian governance. The discussion will also be relevant in main syllabus under the area government interventions for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation. The article is in news because of the recent announcement that the government has decided to merge 
National Sample Survey Office into the Central Statistical Office. At present, if you see under the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, the statistical wing is called as the National Statistical Office and the other wing is Program Implementation Wing. The statistical wing that is the National Statistical Office has two sub offices. One is a Central Statistical Office and the other is National Sample Survey Office. The role played by the Central Statistical Office is different from that of NSSO. Central Statistical Office releases an annual publication called as National Accounts Statistics in addition to other responsibilities. The National Sample Survey Office is responsible for the conduct of large scale sample surveys in various fields on all India basis. Here the data are primarily collected through nationwide household surveys on various aspects. In the present system every year various departments of government send a list of subjects that they like to be surveyed or uh, investigated by the NSSO to the National Statistical Commission. We will see few facts about this commission and then come to the editorial discussion. In January 2000 the government of India has set up a commission to review the statistical system of the country under the chairmanship of Dr. C. Rangarajan, former RBI governor. This commission has recommended the setting up of a national statistical commission. Therefore, the government of India has set up the national statistical commission in June 2005. The commission has envisaged or recommended setting up of a National Statistical Commission to serve as a nodal and empowered body for all core statistical activities of the country. The commission suggested to create NSC by a government order initially and stated that the statutory status has to be given later. But even now also the National Statistical Commission has not received the statutory status. Here the statutory status means that the powers functions and other provisions are based on a law or an act that is the statute of a parliament. If you look at the National Statistical Commission now, more positions are vacant for a long time. There have been several criticisms on the government for not making appointments to these vacant posts. Now let us discuss the editorial. Once the requests for investigation by way of a survey is placed before the National Statistical Commission. The requests or the proposals are discussed with a wider context. Then special working groups are constituted according to the requirements. These groups are chaired by experts from academia and senior uh, officials of the Central Statistical Office and the National Sample Survey Office, state government representatives and also non-official experts. For a survey, special working groups take care of all the processes including the field work from where the required data is to be collected. The results of the survey will be made and the publication of the survey will be given for discussion and approval of National Statistical Commission. After this approval the publication is released. The primary data of the survey are now available in the official government platforms for open access. This allows the academicians and interested users to use the primary data collected by the survey. Note that it is not secondary data. When we mean secondary data, it is simply processed primary data. Let us take an example to understand this. Like marks scored by all the members of a class. Here the obtained marks are primary data. But if they say the average mark scored in this class is 50, then this is the secondary data. Allowing open access to primary data has helped and facilitated the use of these data for intensive analysis by many researchers in various areas. These intense analysis have led to creative controversies which played an important role in shaping the policy and in improving the service. Now how will it help to shape the policy? Say NSSO collects data. A group of researchers find the quality of data is poor. When this is reported, the government asks the NSSO to improve the data. So that quality data will be reflected in government policy. Also when these errors are pointed out, the NSSO also keeps on improving itself every time. The extensive and quality service carried out by the NSSO has gained wide respect among academics, state governments and non-governmental organizations. 
because NSSO has provided the most reliable and comparable basis for discussions in the public arenas, policy and political arenas also. Now, the surveys are approved by independent national statistical commission. The author says if NSSO is merged with CSO, all the data will be reviewed by the government. Now, if uh, government reviews the data, it may not make those data public and this may damage the image of the government among the public. The worry of the author is the merger because it will lead to loss of integrity of data because we all know publishing the truth is integrity. Also in the present system, the National Statistical Commission is also playing its role as a professional body which is independent of the government. It has functioned smoothly and also commands confidence and respect both within the country and also at international level. The author says that the merger will make NSSO's data for approval from the government's department which will damage the credibility of the Indian statistical system. Then the author states that the present institutional arrangements with, the re with respect to NSSO are having certain deficiencies and weaknesses. The author's suggestion is that rather than merging NSSO with CSO, there is scope for improvement even in the present system. Improvement is required in the functioning of the National Sample Survey Office and also with respect to how the data collection is made. This is because there have been accusations about the accuracy and the veracity of the National Sample Survey data. The institutions linked to the sample survey process should invest in carrying out research on improving sample design, field survey methods and validation of data. The first and the second suggestions can be made internally in these institutions. Then uh, increased budgetary allocations are also necessary because the budget of NSSO is inadequate. There has to be greater number of trained field staff because the present number is less. This is serious because the scale of surveys is unmanageably large, mainly because the users demand detailed content and also regional specific estimates. These things have to be done by the government now. Finally, the overall suggestion of the author is do not carry out the merger of NSSO into CSO. With this, we have come to the end of this article discussion. The displayed prelims question will be discussed in the last session. Moving on to the next article which is about the uh, GST tax evasion. The discussion based on this article will be relevant in prelims syllabus under the area current events of national importance and also under rights issues in Indian polity. The news is that the vacation bench in Supreme Court has asked the central government to respond or report on the matter of arresting the individuals for the violations with respect to the goods and services tax. The court has scheduled the hearing in this matter to be heard by a three judge bench. Here note that a vacation bench is a special bench constituted by the Chief Justice of India to hear urgent matters during the summer and winter vacations in the Supreme Court. This matter was taken to Supreme Court as there were varied or different interpretations on the same matter by the concerned state high courts. For example, if you take Telangana High Court, it has said that individuals can be arrested for GST violations, whereas Bombay High Court has stated that no arrest can be made and no coercive action shall be taken against the alleged individuals. There have been allegations on some individuals and firms that uh, they have wrongly availed the input tax credit to the tune of many crores. When we say input tax credit, we refer to the reduction in the tax already paid on inputs and paying the balance amount at the time of paying tax on the output or final product. Here the reduced amount is referred as credit. For example, uh, for a car manufacturer, the tires are one of the inputs, but the final output is the complete car. When a person has not already paid the input tax and somehow wrongly avails the input tax credit while paying the tax on output, it becomes an offence. Section 16 of the Central Goods and Services Tax Act of 2017 deals with the input tax credit. According to Section 69, Subsection 1, and section 132 subsection 1 clause c of central goods and services tax act of 2017 if a commissioner of central tax has reasons to believe that a person has wrongly availed input tax credit to the tune of more than 2 crores then he may authorize any officer of central tax to arrest that person the punishment for the 
illegal or wrongful availing of the input tax credit is as follows. If a person has wrongfully availed more than 5 crore, then uh, he or she can be punished for imprisonment up to 5 years and fine. If a person has wrongfully availed the input tax credit more than 2 crores, but not more than 5 crores, then he or she can be punished for imprisonment up to 3 years and with fine. And if a person has wrongfully availed more than 1 crore but not exceeding 2 crore, then he or she can be punished for imprisonment up to 1 year and with fine. With this, we have come to the end of this article discussion. Moving on to the last article for the day, which talks about the Gaganyan Astronaut Training Agreement. The information based on this article will be relevant in the prelims preparation under the area general science and also in current events of national importance. The discussion will also be relevant under GS Paper 3 of main syllabus in the areas developments in science and technology, achievements of Indians in science and technology, indigenization of technology and developing new technology and also uh, in awareness in the fields of space. The news is that the Indian Air Force and the Indian Space Research Organization has signed a memorandum of understanding that is MOU. The MOU is for imparting training to the Indian astronauts for the ISRO's Gaganyan program. This development formally involves IAF's Bengaluru based medical arm which is the Institute of Aerospace Medicine. The Institute of Aerospace Medicine will be the nodal center to train the first set of Indian astronauts. This development is the formal beginning of the screening and training of Indian Air Force candidates for the human space mission. The training will be a long process and it will end in 2020. So the training is going to take about one and a half years to complete. ISRO has suggested that finally 10 candidates will be trained for the space travel. But only three astronauts will be involved in the mission. And also part of the training would take place outside the country. As three experts from Russia, US and France have already registered their interest in preparing the Indian astronauts at their facilities. Now let us know some key facts about the Gaganyan mission. Our Prime Minister during his Independence Day address in 2018 announced that India's first Indian human space flight mission will be launched in 2022 and it will be successfully carried out by the Indian Space Research Organization that is ISRO. This will be the first human mission indigenously developed by ISRO. ISRO works under the Department of Space, Government of India. Keep in mind that Department of Space is an independent department and it does not come under the Ministry of Science and Technology. You have to note that there have been Indian astronauts who have already been to space earlier like Rakesh Sharma. But Rakesh Sharma flew aboard the Russian rocket. whereas. The Gaganyan mission is indigenously developed by India. The success of this program will make India the fourth nation in the world to launch a human space flight mission. So far only the USA, Russia and China have launched human space flight missions. The Gaganyan mission aims to send a three member crew to space for a period of five to seven days and the spacecraft will be placed in a low earth orbit of 300 to 400 kilometers. The crew will do microgravity experiment during the mission. Microgravity refers to the condition where gravity seems to be very small. In microgravity, astronauts can float in their spacecraft or outside on a spacewalk and heavy objects move around easily. As we discussed already, the crew will be selected by Indian Air Force and ISRO jointly. ISRO has completed the development of launch vehicle for this mission, which is GSLV Mark III. GSLV Mark III is chosen because it has the necessary payload capability to launch a three-member crew module into the low earth orbit. The orbital vehicle will comprise of a crew module and service module. Two unmanned Gaganyan missions will be undertaken prior to sending humans. The total program is expected to, to be completed before 2022. Further, the objectives of the mission are uh, first enhancement of science and technology levels in the country, a national project involving several institutes, academia and industry, improvement of industrial growth, inspiring youth, development of technology for social benefits, improving international collaboration, etc. Beyond all these, Essentially, ISRO has developed some critical technologies like re-entry mission capability, 
crew escape system which is an essential technology for human space flight mission crew module configuration then thermal protection system and also deceleration and flotation system and then subsystems of life support system such as elements of life support system and space suit have also been realized and tested some of these technologies have been successfully demonstrated through some experiments by isro these are uh, the space capsule recovery experiment which was uh, successfully tested in 2007 and the orbital and re-entry mission and recovery operations have been uh, flight demonstrated in this experiment. Then the uh, crew module atmospheric re-entry experiment which was ex successfully tested in 2014 and then the pad board test which was successfully tested in 2018. With this we have come to the end of our analysis session. The displayed prelims question will be discussed in our next session. Moving on to the last session for the day that is the practice questions discussion session. The first question states consider the following statements. Here the first statement may confuse you but the first statement clearly states that equator does not pass through the territory of Maldives. But if the question would have stated the equator does not pass through the land of Maldives then the statement would have been correct because though the equator does not pass through the land part of Maldives it passes through the sea water territory controlled by Maldives and it also separates few islands of the Maldives and as the question states territory which includes land and sea part of Maldives this statement one is wrong. The second statement is correct because 8 degree channel separates the Maldives from luxury we have already discussed this but do not confuse 8 degree channel with 10 degree channel. See a 10 degree channel separates Andaman Islands and Nicobar Islands in the Bay of Bengal not Lakshadweep and Maldives. Therefore as the question asks for correct statement the correct answer to this question is option B 2 only. Now here the next question states to consider the following statements. Here the first statement uh, is correct because NCDRC is a quasi judicial commission in India and it was set up in 1988 under the Consumer Protection Act of 1986. We already discussed this but the second statement is wrong because it states the president of the commission can be a person who is a sitting or retired judge of high court or the supreme court but we know that the president of the commission can only be a person who is a sitting or retired judge of supreme court not high court. So here the second statement is wrong. The question asks for the correct statement as uh, one is the only correct statement the correct answer to this question is option A one only. Now here in the third question uh, if you see the first statement it states the national accounts statistics is released by the national statistical office. Now here the national account statistics is annually released by the national accounts division of the central statistical office. We know that central statistics office comes under the national statistical office. Therefore, it can also be said that national account statistics is released by the national statistical office and ministry wise it is released by the ministry of statistics and program implementation that is also correct. So, the first statement is correct and the second statement if you see it is wrong because if you closely observe they have given the responsibility of the national sample survey office as the responsibility of the central statistical office. You can easily identify it as a wrong statement because the word sample surveys is mentioned here as it is the responsibility of national sample survey office as the name itself suggests. So the question asks for the correct statement here uh, statement one is only the correct statement. So the correct answer to this question is option A one only. Now here the next statement asks us to consider the statements with reference to Gaganyan mission. Here if you see the first statement is correct because as we have discussed already Gaganyan mission is the first human space flight mission of India which is indigenously developed by ISRO. But if you see the second statement it is wrong because here it states Gaganyan mission aims to send crew members to high earth orbit. You, you have to remember that Gaganyan mission aims to send crew members to the low earth orbit at an altitude of 300 to 400 kilometers not high earth orbit. So second statement is wrong and here the third statement states it is launched by geosynchro geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle which is partially correct but the statement states as mark we know that Gaganyan mission will be launched using GSLV mark 3 not 2. So here this statement is also wrong 
as the question asks for the correct statement here only statement 1 is correct so the correct answer to this question is option a 1 only now let us see one practice mains question based on gs paper 3 certain economic indicators show slowdown in the economy does the liquidity crunch in the non banking financial companies and the taxation policies have any link to this slowdown suggest some measures to tackle this situation for answering the first part uh, you can discuss what are the economic indicators that show slowdown of the economy based on our uh, discussion today such as commercial vehicle purchasing has been declining for the last few months then uh, no growth in uh, consumer durable and fast moving consumer goods sales etc then for the second part we know that nbfc crisis and taxation policies have a link to the slowdown so you can uh, substantiate using the points discussed in the analysis session today then for the final part you can list out the solutions such as reduction in tax rates etc then also try to add your own view points based on your understanding of today's analysis if you like the video don't forget to like comment and share and do subscribe to shankar ias academy youtube channel for more updates on upsc civil service examination preparation